Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm chapter 37. Uh, and the, the words of the verse will be on the screen here as is customary, so you can follow along up there as well if you prefer. Starting in verse 1 in, in Psalm 37, we read, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like a noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Now, years ago, many years ago, I watched the movie entitled called Rat Race. I don't know if anybody else here has seen it or not, but a rich tycoon in Las Vegas decides that he's going to uh, have a race. And so he gathers together eight random people. And he tells them that they need to travel about 550 miles and that he's hidden a bag of $2 million in a bank. There's really no rules to the actual game. It's just once he releases them, they go. And he says, whoever gets there first gets the whole prize. Now, initially, they all tell each other that they have no interest in this harebrained activity, that they want nothing to do with it, that they're going to go about just ignoring him. But no sooner than they make it out of the door of the room with which they were meeting, the allure of the prize was too great. And so they all set off in their own ways, singularly focused on that prize. Now along the way, each of the eight people experienced a number of comical disruptions. Uh, for one of them, actually he's my favorite actor that I enjoy watching, uh, he deals with a case of... Uh, uh, now the, uh, the word escapes me. Oh, there we go. Epilepsy it came back to me. He, he dealt with epilepsy. So he would be walking down the road and all of a sudden he'd be snoring and sleeping. For another, they're waylaid by directions. They stop to get directions and someone intentionally tells them the wrong way to go to set them off the path. Another family starts off very quickly. They are no doubt at the beginning in the lead, and they become so confident that they stop along the way for the tourist traffics to admire and see what's there. Another man who is guilted from the past by his taxi cab driver who lost a bunch of money because the call that he blew as an NFL referee weighs him down. And there are many, many other things. But over and over again, their eyes of the contestants are diverted away from the thing that they have, that prize that lies before them. And in the race for this prize that this speaker just quoted from Scripture in this video, there are plenty of distractions that can keep us from laying claim to the prize that we are called to lay claim to. So my sermon in a sentence this week is this. Through the cross, we have been given access by the grace of God to the ultimate gift of eternity spent with our loving God. Don't be distracted by lesser prizes that the world <coughs> offers to us. Now one of my favorite musicians is Kenny G. I figured I'd get a response. I thought maybe that response would come from Emily, but I appreciate you giving that response too. So, 
If you don't know who Kenny G is, he has got to be one of the best, if not the best, alto saxophone players to have ever played. Unbelievably, he held a single note in perfect pitch for 45 minutes and 47 seconds by circular breathing. And it's not just because he could do that that he's might be, he just, his music is incredible. Now imagine if he had looked around as a kid and thought, well, nobody else is really working at this very hard, so why should I be working at this so diligently? Or imagine that he had said, you know what, instead of wasting my time playing this instrument, I'm going to just focus on mastering the recorder. You know, I got that thing as a third or fourth grader, and I'm just going to really get, get great at that. Because, you know, that would have been easy to at least just take that instrument. Now, admittedly, and maybe we heard that here, not everybody's going to appreciate his music like I do. I can sit and listen to him for hours. I really can. It just puts me in a, in a, in a positive mood. We would all rightfully say that the distractions and the mindsets that we're talking about here of things he could have done would not have been helpful for him. And so when we recognize that we have a God-given gift in ourselves or maybe in someone around us, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's our kids, maybe it's someone else sitting in this sanctuary this morning, we ought not squelch it, but instead use it in whatever way we can for God's glory. Now, when Kenny was a young boy, there were others who were more naturally talented than he was. But none was more devoted to his craft as Kenny was. He stayed the course in spite of what was going on around him. He could have looked to his buddies over here or over there or what others were doing and what others maybe were saying. But he didn't. And I think that even in a story like Kenny G, we can learn some spiritual lessons through the lens of Psalm chapter 37 this morning. So first, do not focus, this is from the text, do not focus on those who do wicked. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now, it's really difficult to look around and see what others are doing and not uh, compare ourselves to them, for good or for bad. You know, comparing is something we do naturally. We go to the store to shop and we compare prices. We compare what people look like. We compare what people drive, what size church you attend. We compare politicians to ones from the past or to other states. I've heard that a lot over the last year about comparing governors in different states, which one's better than the other one. We compare celebrities. We compare lifestyles that is ingrained in us. One of the comparisons I see made quite frequently recently is that of the state of this country. I hear people all the time use this expression, it isn't like the good old days. Things have gone downhill since then. Whether we like it or not, our eyes are wired to see things that are alike and things that are different. I think of Luke chapter 18, verse 11, where we have the Pharisee who's standing and praying. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like those other people, those robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even the tax collectors. Like the Pharisee, we can attempt to find honor in what we do because, hey, I can always find someone else that's worse. At least I'm not that person. You know, be thankful for who I am and just let's just, you know, let's just ignore anything bad going on in my life because they got it much worse. And somehow that's a statement almost of honor. We can always find an angle. 
to make ourselves look better and to minimize our bad choices. But when we live the life Jesus calls us to, we are not to be living a life of comparison just to other people. They are not to be our standard for which we live. And we are also not just to follow the ebbs and flows of this life. Because just like Kenny G, not everyone that's in the world around us is striving for the prize that we are to strive for. In Philippians chapter 3, this is right around that passage that was referenced in the video. Paul writes, and this is such a powerful text, Not that I have obtained this prize or that I am already perfect, but I press to make, press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to see what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If you're looking for a passage to store in your heart to memorize and you've struggled, there's a good one to start with. Take some time this week. That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Because what Paul is saying here is, even though many people including many professing believers around you, may be pursuing things, don't be distracted by what they're doing. Don't look to your left or to your right and say, well, you know what, they're pursuing something that looks appealing, and hey, they're getting some tangible results. Let me just kind of, you know, here's where I, I need to be going. Let me just kind of steer off here and take a little detour, and I'll circle back around here at some point and get back on the path whenever it fits my, uh, my benefit. But no, instead of doing that, Paul says, I strain ahead. Now, I'm not quite to the point where I have to strain yet when I take my glasses off, but that express, if you've experienced that, I'll, sometimes when I first take them off, I have to strain just a little bit to adjust my eyes. But it takes all of my energy. I can't strain and then kind of turn and look. My, my straining stops. I have to focus on what it is that I'm really after. But he also in the text says something else equally important. He says, don't let the weight of the things that have come behind you those things that have already passed you by, as we like to say, you can't change the past. So let those things be left behind you. And a very difficult but necessary part, and I've heard this word said by many in here in the last few months, is this ability and this need for discernment that we need to prayerfully and carefully consider what it is that directs our paths in this life. Who is it that is the ultimate decision maker in your life? Is it you? Is it some other person? Or is it God? Who is it that makes those decisions? Point number two. Even when evil seems to be prospering, continue to faithfully follow Jesus. And this is a tough one. I get this question quite frequently asked, and that is, why does evil exist? Very common question. In fact, that, that's rooted at the core of so many questions that people have. But I'm going to go further with this and add an addendum, an additional question that gets asked quite frequently. And it's this, why does evil seem to be prospering so frequently? And then how, do we, how are we to respond to that? How should we respond in light of the fact that, you know what, evil sometimes has its day. And sometimes that day can feel like a long period of time. So I want to give you in that state, if you're ever in that state of mind, 
I know that I can fairly say, fairly confidently say that everybody has been at that point at some point in their life where they wonder, why is this? Here I am trying to do the right thing as best as I can, and yet I'm not seeing the fruits that I feel like I should be feeling. So first, it is perfectly okay to ask God why. Don't hide your worries and your doubts. On when, this past Wednesday, I talked a little bit at the Bible study about how doubts can actually be a bit of a blessing. Because when we doubt, we recognize that we don't have all of the answers. We don't know everything. And that God may have given it to us so that there needs to be a spirit of humility in our lives. If I knew everything, I don't need anybody else. I don't need God. I've got all the answers. But I don't. Keep your thoughts honest about your confusion. Secondly, keep praying. Keep reading your Bible. Don't run away from God into your own opinions and mindsets. Fight bitterness at every turn. You know, we want to turn inward and think, okay, what am I doing wrong here? What do I need to do differently? Maybe you even go to the, you know, can you give me some advice as to what you're doing and help me? And you get bitter about it. If you don't, you know, and you're not seeing it, you're like, what's going on here? And so we, we oftentimes do everything to remove ourselves from God's word. We say, well, that's, that's got to be the factor that's the cause for this. So therefore, I, I'm going to just kind of set that stuff aside. Now, you may not always see those answers immediately, but if you keep searching, you will. I promise you this. You will eventually gain some peace and understanding. Understand always that those answers, God is constantly answering our prayers. We don't always see the prayer answer that we want, but there's a deeper underlying issue there as well. And one of the things that fits into that is point number three, or the third observation, that's be glad about the trials. How many of you that are in the midst of trials are glad about them? Not that they exist. Don't get me wrong. It's not that we're glad that they are part of our reality, but that it's with the help of God's strength alone we can endure them. Trials stand out starkly on the backdrop of genuine faith. The confusing trials that life can give us can either kill you or they can refine you. Number four, remember that God loves you no matter what you go through, what you see, hear about, or feel. I tell you, we have fastly devolved in this world to a people of feeling and emotion. Reality has now for many become, oh, this is how I feel, that's got to be their ultimate reality. And yes, emotions cannot be and should not be removed. God is the salvation of our entire being. But they are not the arbiter of truth. We are reminded in John chapter 3, 16, that God so loved us, he loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, that may have seemed like an injustice at the time. You know, God sending his son to die. But in reality, we can look back and say, God had a purpose. God had a plan. He knew what it was going to lead to. And that was for the atonement of our sin. Now, think about that for just a second. As I'm speaking it again this morning, I'm realizing for another time how vital that is for our understanding. We, can, we could look at that perspective in that time. We could be one of the disciples or an onlooker and say, look what just happened. God, why would you send your son and allow him to die? What possible good purpose could that serve? But now we can look back and say, 
that trial that was present in Jesus' life, but also in the lives of those who followed him, turned out to be the greatest blessing that ever happened. Not only for them, but for all of us. Remember, fifthly, that you're not alone. See, when Jesus rose again, and then he left his disciples, do you remember what he said? He said he would send a helper. And not only would he send a helper, he said that the helper was something that someone that they needed even more than Jesus, the Holy Spirit. It's through the Spirit that he allows us the wisdom to understand better and to overcome these trials. And finally, and this, God will eventually bring injustice and wrong action into his light. And this may be the hardest of the six. At the end, we are told that the, end, the mourners and the victims will be made new again. God doesn't overlook when people are mistreated. He uses it in some way for their good. Now, I was talking with someone recently, and they were mentioning about this very topic of evil seeming to win. And as I listened to them talk, you know, there was a great level of frustration coming out of them, understandably, like we probably all have experienced when we see that going on. And yet, what I couldn't miss in that, and there's a, we talked about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning, there's a little bit of this in all of us, we want to see justice carried out now. And we want to see justice carried out on our terms. We want to deal with it, and, have, and we want those things to be dealt with. So that, on display, so that we can feel better about whatever it was, whatever hurt it was that we experienced. We all despise, I'm included in this, we all despise evil that is unchecked when it seems to win and, and we want to see justice imposed. But I ask you to flip the situation around. Put yourself on the other side of the coin here for a minute. How eager are you to have others looking to dish out that justice to you on their terms. I was reminded of a line from Lord of the Rings as I put this together um, from Gan uh, Gandalf, I think is who it was that said it. He said, we need to be careful. He says, um, let me find here my place here again a second. Um, sorry, I lost my spider. We ought not to be too eager to dole out death and judgment on others. When you find yourself wanting to, to, to seek and determine justice on your own terms, practice the pause and think about it. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. So when you find yourself angry and bitter and wanting to see justice done, remind yourself you deserve the same judgment. We deserve judgment, but not as we would give one another. We deserve the righteous judgment from a righteous, perfect God. In the, in the moments in your life, in the circumstances, maybe in the specific areas where you know you are prone to judge people, I say again, stop, pause, and pray about it. And then once you're done praying, stop, pray some more. Do you trust in God's ability to take care of the injustices in our world, or don't you? Now, even when you don't see the end, you can still focus on the many good things in life, as, you, as many good things as you can. But sometimes, in different stages of life, it's difficult to find the good. 
The good sometimes feels like listening for a quiet whisper in a loud, chaotic room. But nevertheless, keep your eye fixed for those things, for those little little bits of light, those things, those testimonies that sometimes come in small ways. Treasure them in your heart and in your soul, and then communicate them with others. Talk about what you are seeing, the positives in this life. Keep the good alive along with the bad. Now this may sound like a simple thing, but sometimes the little things are the things that help you get through the tough things. And finally, anger that leads to judgment is not ours. God's perfect justice rules the day. Now anger, I've, I heard, I've heard this a lot from people, you know, oh, I got angry, I got angry. And anger itself is a natural emotion. Anger is not the sin. Sometimes anger is even called for. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it's important that what we it's more important what we do with that anger. Consider what that verse says. It says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Anger in and of itself is not inherently sinful. But we need to understand that when anger is in our lives, it's as though we are living with a tiger crouching outside of our doorway, ready to pounce. If you leave it unchecked, if you don't put that gate up around it and block it off, you're going to pay the price for it later on. When you are angry, your ability to reason is severely limited. And if you think that you're an exception somehow to that, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. When you're angry, you can't reason the way that you normally would. So as Darren said this morning, practice the pause when you're angry. We need to step back and allow ourselves to cool down because, hey, Scripture tells us the anger of man, this is James chapter 1, verse 20, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And we all, all know very well the passage that precedes that, which tells us about the importance to be slow to anger. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 says that anger is lodged in the hearts of fools. It's stuck and it cannot be taken out easily. Anger gets in the way of us being able to live at peace with one another. But instead, we need to be more like our Savior, quick to forgive and let go of our anger and show grace. And I'll ask that question I asked a minute ago again. This is kind of my question for the day. Do you trust God's ability to take care of the injustices of this world? Or don't you? So who can count the, amount, the, the enormous number of distractions that are in our lives? We've had many already in the number of, whatever number of years you've lived. There's countless distractions that try to take us away from the path of righteousness. The number is inconceivable to the human mind. Because of this, and the fact that we have an infinitesimally small capability to see what the future brings, we are all prone to wander off to be taken in by the lesser things of this world, the lesser kingdoms, the idols of the world. And in this, we must be like Paul. As was expressed in this video, we must keep our eyes fixed on the prize that is awaiting the faithful. Keep straining forward and don't let the trappings of this world turn you away. Use discernment. Trust in the Spirit's leading. Pray for God's wisdom that you can focus on the task that is before you so that on the day that you stand before God, you will hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. We are to serve one master. Yahweh, the one true God.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for your word that it is so clearly laid out to us what that prize is that we are to long for, to focus on, Lord. It is that prize that you have promised those who are followers of you that we will spend eternity with you. And yet, we are not removed in this life from sin and temptation, just as your son wasn't in his time on earth. Lord, he understands what we are going through, and yet he gave us an example of someone uh, who sought to strain ahead perfectly, Lord, and, and through Paul, even though Paul didn't do it perfectly, we can look at his life and acknowledge that he sought to push those things that would be distracting in his life, that would take his eyes off of you, and he sought to remove them and allow you to, to place those things um, behind him, Lord, and away from his presence. Lord, we ask today that you would do the same work in us. Help us to keep focus not on what our um, people that maybe have had influence in our lives in negative ways are doing, or even looking around us at what is going on in our world. Lord, in fact, I think we most, mostly, if not all of us, would acknowledge that what we see in our world is, is, uh, is very much the opposite of what you long for in many cases. So, Lord, give us the discernment through your spirit to, uh, to walk this race well, to finish it well, so that we can uh, take claim to that prize and that we can stand before you one day and hear your acknowledgement. Well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, I pray your blessing on each person here today that we may be a blessing to those and that we may help to shape the reality and to help people's minds be renewed and transformed into uh, your likeness, Lord, that they may see that we are living a life that is intended uh, to, to grow closer and be more aligned with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the closing song. Just a reminder again, don't leave before you go downstairs and get a little bit of ice cream. So I might be a minute before I get down there, so if someone's willing to go down there, just make sure the stuff is taken out of the fridge and the freezer, and then we'll just kind of do a self-serve. The bowls and everything else are out, okay? Uh, oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable is his ways. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.